<laughs> thank you, Steve. And thank you for having me. About uh, 20 years ago, I was uh, having lunch with uh, my daughter and my six-year-old grandson, and I was talking about doing a uh, family history book. And Jake, my grandson, he's kind of wondering what what uh, family tree. You know, he's thinking of uh, branches and leaves and squirrels. And then, uh, so anyway, I, I had a, there was a nap in there, and I thought I'll just draw a little chart. So with the boxes and with his name and uh, his mom and dad and his grandparents. And he looks at it for a second and he says, uh, where, where does Zoe go? Mm -hmm. Well, where did he go? <laughs> <laughs> uh oh. That's Jake and Zoe. <laughs> so, so, Zoe was part of his family. I've been interested in my family ancestors uh, since about his age, about the same age. And uh, it's been a, a lifelong hobby, I guess, and journey to uh, trace uh, different branches of my family tree. Um, hopefully, tonight I can give you a little bit of insight. And uh, based on some of my family pictures and some of the stories. This is my first ever family tree chart <laughs> from the time I was about 15. And uh, you can see it's a little sketchy on the, on the number of names. In fact, I actually had a couple of, couple of names here that turned out to be wrong. But uh, the important thing uh, that I I kind of recall were the stories, and I made notes, and I've always done that. And hopefully, uh, if you're interested in, in doing your family history, that you'll you'll think I'm doing the same. Um, I'm so glad that I did. Just a couple of things that were you know stick out right now. This Bill Simons uh, was my great great grandmother's cousin. And the story was, and then I wrote it down here, cousin of Elizabeth, fought for each, um, I'm sorry, for both North and South in the Civil War. And he wanted to marry Elizabeth. And my three times great grandmother, Clarissa Simons, was uh, supposedly the first white child born in Hulton County. She was born in 1807. This is her, this is Clarissa Simons here. Uh, she's probably about 75 in this picture. And uh, as it turned out, she probably was a, one of the, maybe not the first child, but according to this article, uh, she was the first white female child. Her son, George Wilkinson is a, uh, gentleman that died and the uh, death notice that was in the paper is, is how we got that information. So hopefully uh, you'll be able to sometime uh, check out newspapers for some of the stories that you, that you know of but have never been able to prove. In the Burlington Library you can get uh, microfilm copies of all the spectators since uh, 1846. My main storyteller, when I was a boy, and it would happen on Saturday mornings, when uh, my brother and I would go to my grandparents to watch TV, watch the westerns, because we didn't have a TV. So some of you maybe will remember. Sorry, we lost the image. Oh, have we? <coughs> Keep talking. We lost the image. We got him. We do. Okay. So, some of you may remember Roy Rogers, <laughs> Lone Ranger on Saturday morning TV. Well, this was my thermos. I was a big Roy Rogers fan. <laughs> <laughs> well, this 
My grandfather was a good athlete, played baseball in Thermo and Milton, and uh, this is his actual bat. It's a Louisville slugger, and uh, I'll pass that around too. You can uh, have a feel, it's pretty heavy. Don't hurt yourself for anybody else. Anyway, he would tell me the stories about uh, my ancestors, but also the stories of things that he was actually living at the time that you know, and it had an impact on me. This is a Hamilton market. First uh, started uh, in 1837. This picture is from about 1895. Uh, you can see the wagons, uh, all, all had to be, all the projects had to be brought by horses and wagons. During the day, the horses had were stabled and they had to be fed. And the farmers on the top of the escarpment would bring hay down the mountain. And one of the stories that's always stuck is that it was very dangerous because if the brakes failed on the wagons, they'd run up, the wagons would run up on the backs of the horses. By 1916, we were getting to be more uh, motorized uh, vehicles. This is a 1912 Ford truck uh, with 1916 fenders, which is kind of bizarre, but it helped, uh, helped date, the, uh, date the picture and the other pictures that I have. So they, they were able to move further away from where the market was. This is the uh, first high level bridge over. Uh, uh, well, it was 12 Mile Creek then, now Briney Creek at Dundas. Uh, the, the, uh, my grandfather and family lived right beside the, the creek, and he would tell about how the old Model T Fords, the gas was gravity fed. There were no uh, there were no fuel pumps, so they had to back the cars up the bank. So here's the bridge on the bottom of the ravine. If you can just kind of see the the road, how the road went up the bank over here. It took uh, about four years to build, uh, build the bridge, between 1916 and 1920. In the, 19, the 20s, 1920s, the uh, forts and tractor was uh, at kind of most of the market, about 70%. This was a Ford Motor Company, made the forts, and uh, they had uh, most of the market. Farmers also still had their uh, teams of horses, these are Percherons, uh, going for firewood, the uh, uh, stoves and the kitchens were all fire, firewood. Uh, a story very vivid to me, uh, because I had a personal experience was when I was probably about seven, same age, you know, going to like for uh, the westerns and uh, having uh, dinner there. My grandmother's apron caught on fire. And I was saying to her almost right beside her, and I'm like terrified. I think the flames are coming up out of her off her apron. She very calmly, as she's walking over towards the sink, undoes the apron, puts it in the sink, and uh, turns on the tap. And I'm, now I'm thinking she probably needed a new apron anyway. But it was, it was unbelievable. I want to never forget that. This uh, is a picture of a 1929 Pierce Arrow. That's uh, my grandfather, who is sitting right here, uh, bought to, in 1936 to take the uh, rural kids to uh, Burlington High School. Otherwise, they had no way of getting a high school education after the, the, uh, they finished up the one-room schools in uh, grade eight. Uh, the story in this picture is that they were on the way to see the Dion Tuplets in Calendar, Ontario, and they ran out of gas <laughs> near Aurelia. Anyway, they eventually made it. Uh, I have quite a passion for uh, family genealogy. And sometimes I think there is not too much difference between passion and uh, 
kind of crazy, walkers. <laughs> because when I'm uh, up at 2 o'clock in the morning, emailing somebody, uh, you know, for some cousin, distant cousin that I've come across, and Melissa's uh, being very patient and wondering what the heck I'm doing. But uh, that's, I'm looking for one more clue. And just to kind of emphasize the craziness sometimes, is this is a, a reunion of uh, uh, my Robinson uh, branch. Uh, this is my grandmother's family. This is in northern England. Uh, there were about 12 of us in this group. I was in May. It was rainy and cold, and we were frozen and uh, soaked. And I'd do it again in a heartbeat. And it's, it was awesome, it really was. So we were looking for uh, uh, corn mills and cemeteries. And the Robinson, here, here's the, their church. Uh, it's a little place called Crosby Ravensworth. Love the names. But anyway, they, they, uh, here's the churchyard. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, cemeteries. The uh, there is a website called uh, Find a Grave. It's a really good, really excellent website. But not all those stones are on the, on the website. There's millions of them. And in fact, St. Lawrence Church, this church, is on the website. And there are about 120 stones pictured with photographs actually on the site. But they're not all on there because this one isn't. And this is my four times great grandparents. And uh, luckily, we found it in, the, in a churchyard. Uh, not, I didn't, thanks to one of my, actually, my third cousin, who's from, uh, from probably Ravensworth. We, we were able to get this picture. Important when you're starting out with your family tree, besides uh, you know, making notes of the stories and, uh, and kind of keeping track of uh, birth, marriage, death, stuff that if you can get to some cemeteries. This was the first Norton of my family, anyway, that uh, came to Canada. And this, this beautiful stone actually says uh, that he came in 1837, which was very helpful for tracing uh, going back in the, in the, uh, for my ancestors. What was the problem? And that's sometimes uh, what you run into is that he was not born at Headingham. He was born at a little place called Blowfield, which was 25 kilometers away from Headingham. The problem was that as a as a baby, more or less, he grew up in Headingham. So that's what he always knew. But it was to find the records, well, it takes takes some searching. This comes later. This is not when you're first starting a, a family tree, not to you know, get too hung up on trying to find uh, records from 1700 and something. This stone here was always a puzzle because it was in the Norton plot. And uh, it's in memory of Prudence Forbes. And at the time when I was young, I you know, wasn't really not educated. It didn't twig on me, but anyway, I couldn't figure out for a long time. But Prudence died at 38, uh, very tragically, and I'll talk about that a little later. So we've covered uh, family stories and some about relationships. Uh, maybe I'll just touch a bit more on relationships. What I'm talking about really is calling that, that long lost aunt or the grouchy cousin that your mother told you about. They may not be that much, but anyway, it's important that you get uh, get in touch with uh, you know, these people that may have information that, that would be helpful. Now we're uh, uh, going to talk about you're ready to start, really, and you've gathered some information, you've got some uh, some names, some and dates and things and uh, some stories. So it's time to think about how are, how are you going to store all this information? So you're not going to do it on, uh, on charts, even though you can still buy them. 
and uh, I did that at one time. But you really need to have some software. You either have to do that or you have to go on an on online website. I personally don't recommend that. It's expensive and uh, I don't know about all of the programs. I know that the one that I use, they don't, they aren't good for printing books. And uh, most of them probably pass around the books and that, but um, what we're going to do is talk about uh, the, the uh, program I use. It's called Legacy. You download the program, and this is what you're going to get. This is going to be the, the first page where you're going to fill in information. You're going to fill in your yourself. So you're going to put your name here, and your birth, birth date, and where you were born. This is also where you uh, will put in source records. It's very important, that even as a beginner, that you, tra you keep track of where you got the information. Very important. After you put in 50 people, to go back and start finding sources is, is a real job. It's, too, it's, it's discouraging almost. You best do it at the time. We'll, we'll cover more on sources in a bit. But it's important that we, we put in the sources. So after you put in the name and you've got your kids' names and your, your parents' names, this is what the page is going to look like in Legacy. So we've got, uh, I just happen to have my grandfather here, but this is uh, uh, his individual page now. Um, his wife, the colors are keeping the lines, the branches. So all of the norms will be red, all of the Robinsons will be yellow. Um, you can see uh, again the birth date, the death date, and where Mary's buried and the death cause. All this information you type in and the, the program does the rest, basically. This is what everybody that's first thinking about a family tree, I think, has in their mind. And, uh, you know, it's awesome, the program does it. You've entered all this stuff, it'll automatically do the tree. Um, unfortunately, part of the problem is you can't, if you've got eight generations, you can't put it on one page. So you end up with a bunch of different pages, you've got to tape it together, or you have to pay to uh, send away part of Legacy as a charting um, division, and you'll pay for a big chart that you can put on the wall. Um, it's it's kind of cool, but it's just a small part of a family history, really. The, uh, you, the, the stories and everything that uh, make it come alive, you, this is not going to show that. This is not even showing where these people came from, showing the dates of uh, birth and death. So, you know, on one hand, that's kind of neat, but really what we'd like to do is, is uh, do a book. Uh, one of the first books I did was on the Robinsons, and Melissa and I were in. Uh, uh, and Crosby Ravensworth, and this is my third cousin. Uh, he loves the book. Well, he did, unfortunately, he's passed away. But he wasn't letting that book go. He's got a grip on it, and <laughs> he's not giving that to anybody. He had a big impact on, on the, you know, if I hadn't found him, which is one of those stories where you get lucky sometimes. Um, I mean, you can, nowadays on Ancestry, if you want to spend three hundred dollars, you can you know, find people. But I found him by writing to the Historical Society in Crosby Ravensworth, and uh, I had a picture of the Robinsons that uh, he was he sent it from, the same as me, and that's how we how we connected. But we had some great times. We actually found the uh, house where. Uh, I can figure it out in my head, but it's five or six times. Uh, my grand, great grandfather was born in 1680, and the house is still there. It's, it's mind boggling, really, really, just, you know, stunned. 
And Crosby Ravensworth, actually, let me go back here. We're standing right now in front of the Butcher's Arms. And it was a pub which they had restored, Mike and his brother and a few other people. And they had restored the Butcher's Arms. And we had lunch there. Well, this was the Butcher's Arms in 1910. And this is a postcard, which, uh, you know, if you, if you don't have photographs, you can probably find a postcard if you really try hard enough. And put that into your book is really, really neat, really worthwhile. And this would be where my uh, great-grandfather and great-grandmother met. He, would, uh, he lived in a little village called Malt Beaver that was just a couple of kilometers away. She actually worked at a house just here. This is Malt Beaver, beautiful little village. Uh, this is the main street of Malt Beaver during rush hour. <laughs> there is a car here. Believe it or not, but anyway, it's a beautiful little spot, and uh, the Robinsons are corn millers. And they, uh, when the younger generation, sorry, the younger siblings, got to, you know, the working age, there were not enough room. There was not enough room in the mills, so only the older siblings inherited the mills. And here we. Uh, went from uh, Malls Beaver to uh, Burlington. More, much more, many more opportunities. And in 1888, my great-grandfather came to Burlington. And here, here he is. This is on uh, Dundas 407 Highway to be back here. <laughs> but he's, uh, he's plowing, started dairy farming, the important industry in, uh, in Halton back in the early 1900s. Still is, really, but very much so then. The horses, this is a, one of the horses from the, the team. They didn't really get any rest either, even in the winter. And here's the, uh, uh, the sleigh for school and church and uh, socializing, going for uh, uh, supplies, whatever. Looks um, pretty cold. But the dairy farming was a tough job. They had 12, 12 cattle in those days, but it took 10 or 15 minutes to milk one cow. So if you do, you know, any quick math, easy math, it's going to take like three hours for one person to milk those 12, 12 cows. Got to be morning and night, seven days a week. Mm -hmm. Once, uh, you know, once my grandfather got old enough to help. I spoke my great grandmother, I'm not so sure. I never ever knew or heard of her actually uh, working in the fields. My grandmother, yes. So, anyway, that's, uh, that was the story of the Robinsons. Uh, threshing, thrashing actually uh, is pronounced mostly in the uh, uh, harvest season, August, was uh, a community thing. The threshing machines were. Sometimes owned by an individual, but quite often by the community. I'm pretty sure that uh, based on the tax returns that I have, that they, it was a community machine because the only thing I could see, you know, they had equipment on the taxes on the tax return, but no thrashing machine. The only expense in 1921, I know, was uh, uh, sixteen dollars for 35 meals. So roughly 50 cents a meal, and they, uh, they had uh, the neighbors would help thrash the uh, oats or wheat, whatever, and then uh, they'd move to the neighbors and they'd do hits, and they go in the, in the community with the one machine. So that's kind of the end of uh, a little bit on the, uh, of the stories and the, and the book and the legacy. Legacy is... Uh, Quite worthwhile from my perspective. There are other ways, but legacy is a, a cost three four ninety five US, and uh, it's pretty easy to download, pretty user friendly, and the books that uh, maybe you could pass uh, around are uh, pretty uh, beautiful. Uh, I have to do the entry of all the birth and marriage and all that stuff, and the stories and the photographs. So this is what uh, what the result is. Uh, ancestry 
nowadays uh, you see a lot of that on uh, on TV, a lot of commercials about ancestry. And you know, they're talking about uh, finding their ancestors back to the Ice Age. Well, okay, no, maybe not. I'm sure, I'm sure not. But there are occasions where you know, people can, can go back a long way. But uh, I don't recommend ancestry like to, to, to start. I, I certainly think legacy is worth the 35 bucks to you know to start uh, after you've gathered some information and checked out some cemeteries and uh, talked to some uh, relatives, cousins, whatever. Um, but be sure you get the dates, and then you get to uh, your, uh, your software and you put put it all in. But Ancestry does not actually print books. And uh, it's it's fa fantastic for sources for finding records, uh, fantastic for uh, uh, finding hints. But uh, one census, for example, here's my grandmother. But this is a page from Ancestry, and it's found the 1911 census, a 1921 census, a 1931 census. Once I get the name in there, I really don't even have to look. And just automatically uh, is going to find those censuses. So from that perspective, that answer is, ancestry is really good. But like I say, it's not going to print books, and uh, it's going to uh, help you find relationships. You might find, uh, uh, I, know, I guess I give an example for me. Find uh, relatives in England. I found relatives all over the U.S., Saskatoon, Colorado, and um, some, of them, some amazing people. Here's another page from uh, Ancestry. This is cool. This is kind of a cool thing because here's uh, my grandmother down here, and these are her, her parents. Or, sorry, these are her parents. And then up here is her. Uh, her great grandparents, and you can drag the chart. You can drag the chart side to side, up and down. Get all the all the uh, uh, generations in, in the same chart. Uh, as far as sources go, there are two kinds of sources: preliminary, or sorry, primary, and secondary. Primary sources are uh, records that happened at the time of the event. So for example, here we have uh, uh, a marriage record from 1816. And that date, the date is somewhere in here, uh, 25th day of February of the year 1816. That date is a, this record is a primary source for that date and those, those two people. So Robert Robinson, you can be sure that he was married, I mean not 100%, but 99.9% .9 sure that he was married in 1816 and his wife's name was Elizabeth Walker. I put this in here just because of uh, uh, Robert uh, Robinson that we just looked at. He operated this mill, this mill in uh, Malt Meeburn for about 70 years. And this is was very cool for me to find this picture. It's uh, about uh, 1900. Um, this is the actual mill that he worked in now. This is another uh, example of a, of a source. This is an entry of birth for uh, Agnes Ann Robinson. And this is another primary source that you can say this is exactly when she was uh, born. In Canada, well, this kind of looks a little sketchy, a little iffy, but this is just as good as the one we just looked at. This is the, uh, the uh, uh, provincial Ontario, provincial vital statistics records 
and this is our birth. And, uh, down here where you can see the date. When born? September 9, 1876. You can find these through the Government of Canada, the Government of Ontario website. You can find them. It's just not as easy as on something like Ancestry. Ancestry would find this very easily and very easy to make a copy. And so I can make the copy. I can put it in a book or I can uh, uh, describe it. I can uh, uh, actually put the, the actual wording of the uh, of the document into the into the tree. Back when I first uh, started tonight, I mentioned about Bill Simon's cousin. This is one of those things that happens maybe two or three times in a lifetime. I get an email. Well, actually, it doesn't have my email first. It goes through uh, Ancestry, a, a contact method they have. But we quickly went from a contact to uh, emails, email back and forth a couple times. Uh, the, my fourth cousin once removed from Virginia wanted some information on uh, Bill Dad Simons and uh, Clarissa that we talked about. I sent her some information. She seems a, you know, a nice person. You kind of have to weigh it sometimes. And uh, I sent her uh, all the information that I had. A few days later, later I get an email. No, no message. No nothing. Just a picture. This is uh, Bill Simons that uh, fought in the Civil War. And it was Joseph Simon's son from Burma. They actually lived in Brani at the uh, at the time <laughs> when he left to go to fight in the uh, Civil War. Now the weird thing here is his real name is Albert, but he went by Bill. But it, this is uh, the same guy. Mr. Simons was born. Where is my cursor? Whoops. He was born on September 30th, 1840, at Brony, Ontario, Canada, and moved to the United States when he was 14 years old. There's no other Brony in Ontario. They spelled it wrong, but this is a, this is a guy. And a, to, to actually get that picture, after like 50 years of thinking this is you know, just one of those legends, so how can that even be true, you know? But there it is. So we looked at uh, some software, uh, talked about the internet. I should mention actually, uh, besides Ancestry, there is a, a website called Family Search that uh, is free. So, and it's pretty amazing too, of uh, you know, coming up with some names that you might be able to connect to. The difference is, and I, I don't really do, do it, use it very much, the difference is it's one big tree. Ancestry is a whole bunch of different trees. So this lady in Virginia, her tree is connected to my tree. But on Stanley Search, it's everybody. You go on there and somebody's uh, you know, putting information on your line. And you can put information on somebody else's line. There's no line, there's no family. Um, and, uh, I don't know for sure, but I don't think there's any way of printing uh, books from Family Search. I'm not you know, 99% sure. So it's free. It's probably helpful as a you know in the beginning, but it's uh, not something that uh, that I would put a lot of stock in as far as uh, um, actual records, because I'm afraid that there's too much. What happens is uh, what I call the uh, uh, snowball effect, where somebody you know puts something in there and pretty good, and then somebody else thinks, oh yeah, that sounds good, that must be right. Then they're putting it in there, and they think, you know, now we got two people thinking it's right. Pretty soon it's four, and then they own it's hundreds, and it could be completely wrong. I've gone down that road a couple of times, and uh, fortunately I've been able to correct a couple of things. 
Uh, one goes back to uh, Germany in the early 1600s that uh, I was able to uh, um, trace from a uh, lady that actually, at, uh, she was a doctor at the University of Guelph, first contacted me in 1977. And she had uh, this, us, our, our family, and it was all right back to 1650 to uh, New York where uh, they first came. And it was all absolutely cracked. But before that, it was, a, it was iffy. And when I was doing my book, and I was doing it with one, you know, somebody I connected with, two people, both from California, amazing, amazing genealogists, and uh, they were not convinced either. And they connected the one fellow, uh, it's unbelievable, I don't know if anybody's been descended here from DeWitt's in Stony Creek where DeWitt Road is, but uh, this guy has a website, it's called Mr. Jumbo, and uh, he was able to trace uh, our, our family before 1650 through a guy in Germany, because the fellow in California could speak uh, German. You know, this is part of the problem when you're, when you're looking at, you know, somebody in Italy or whatever, if you don't speak the language. I'm talking about you know, English, uh, most of my ancestors, you know, the U.S. is easy, England is easy, Scotland's not bad, Canada's pretty easy. <laughs> But, uh, uh, so this fellow, Doug Bradley is his name, he's my ninth cousin. He, uh, he was able to get us back to where the actual farm is in uh, North, what's now Germany, it was Holland, actually back then. But fascinating story in the, the book, uh, you know, it was, uh, and then interestingly, I caught up with the, uh, with the uh, psychology professor, doctor from, uh, Guelph, retired, of course, caught up with her, was kind of lucky, but uh, found her, and she was so thrilled to get a book, and because uh, I, I said in the book how, how great her research was, <coughs> but she had never said in the book, and I made reference to that in mind, but she had never said that it was right, what she uh, thought might have been uh, the case in, 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 in Amsterdam. So it was pretty cool that uh, she uh, she appreciated that not actually getting the, the facts all the way back to the uh, late 1500s. Uh, I'll talk quickly about uh, censuses. Um, this is, uh, an, I think, a neat artist's rendition of the docks in uh, East London on the Thames River. My uh, two times great grandfather on my mother's side was uh, Pietro Bonifacio, and he uh, ran away from home at nine years old because he didn't like his stepmother. At nine years old, he went to sea. He sailed on uh, uh, a bunch of different ships, and he learned to speak four languages. Even though he couldn't read or write, he became an interpreter on the London docks. And that's how he met my two times great grandmother, who was a, a sail maker, Neil Wong, they called him. They worked on making the sails. Because he couldn't read or write, they apparently only paid him half of what they paid the others. So uh, she was not happy, his wife was not happy about that. So they immigrated to uh, Ontario in 1871. And uh, Pietro actually carved one of the ships. This is uh, one of the ships that he, uh, he sailed on. And it, it still actually is in existence it's in Georgia somewhere. I saw it at one time, about 10 years ago. And uh, the, uh, I would be, uh, was my second cousin once removed. Really nice gentleman in Clarkson, Michigan. But I went and stayed at their house over a uh, uh, weekend and we did some things together. Not long before he passed away, he sent me this little box, and I'm, I don't I have no idea what, what you know, what's going on. This is Pietro's pocket watch. It's, to have that as, you know, as a memory and an heirloom is so unbelievable. But I never would have had that if I didn't have uh, this interest in the family tree 
and found uh, Lee Bonner is his name. They changed their name when they went to the U.S. They were either running away from something or anything. They didn't want to. They didn't want to be thought of as being Italian. Their <laughs> name was going to change. But anyway, Lee Bonner was the fellow's name. And uh, I connected with him. It's interesting because, and that's why again I keep saying the same thing over and over. You get in touch with those cousins or your mother, grandmother, or mother, whatever that's, that's still here. And uh, maybe you get a connection. It happened here. My mother had actually connected with him. It was uh, you know, her second cousin. Uh, that can be seen pretty far, but in her case, she knew who, who he was. And before she passed away, she gave me his, his address, and I connected with him. So that's kind of the stuff that sometimes you get really lucky. This is a census uh, in 1861. Here, interestingly, they're calling themselves Boniface. They were actually Bonifacio, but there was a stigma, it's on, you know, even back then, about, you know, it would be better than being in English if they had an English sounding name. Uh, he was then a dock laborer. Uh, he was really an interpreter. I had that, got that from a couple of different sources. So the census is are quite interesting. 1861 is pretty, you know, just uh, basic information. Tells us uh, uh, he's the head of the family, uh, his age, doesn't give a birthday, just the age. That's helpful, but it's not necessarily always that accurate. And where he was born, this is not, maybe not that accurate either. We're still working on that. It's interesting that some branches I can go far back, others not. So not to discourage anybody. I've got branches where I have a brick wall after you know, my two times great grandfather. Can't do it. Uh, for 50 years, tried. And uh, you cannot figure out, I guess, you know, at nine, he runs away. He's not, he doesn't even know, probably doesn't even know his birthday or who his parents were. Oh, sorry. Pietro died in 1903. He and Sarah had 28 grandchildren. My grandmother was one of them. And in 1906, so if you put that together, he, he dies in 1903. His granddaughter, who she would she would have known him, and uh, she bought a cottage on Burlington Beach in uh, 1906. And this would be the cottage here. We actually got a second cottage in 1917. Um, the cottage cost $587, which I'm sure was a lot of money then. But interestingly, and I learned this from the census, censuses are, and I kind of jump around sometimes here, but censuses are, are fairly easy to find nowadays. Even the, the uh, province of Ontario, the government of Ontario, you can go on there and find the census. Not as easy as ancestry, but you've got to be at the point where you're really committed to working on a family tree before you go there, I think. But on the, on the census, it showed that my grandmother actually made $420 for the year. And how she did that was she had a music studio and she was an organist at a big church in Hamilton. She made $420 for the year, but my, uh, her brothers, my uh, great uncles, they made 320, 240 for the year. So, they, you know, just to give you an idea, she was doing pretty good just from playing the organ and teaching kids music. But anyway, she was she was cool. But unfortunately, uh, here she is in the center here. This is on the beach in front of the cottages with her mother and her sister-in-law. Uh, fortunately, uh, Lily, my grandmother, died when she was 36. And uh, so I obviously didn't know her. Um, Burlington Beach was a 
big tourist attraction in the 20s, well, actually the early 1900s. And uh, in the 1920s, early 20s, this uh, ship, steamship, sailed from Toronto. It was actually owned by the uh, Niagara Navigation Company. And they had a regular route to Niagara on the lake. But and they, uh, for two or three years in the early 20s, they actually stopped at Hamilton and brought people from Toronto who would then take from the port. This is a ship, this is a ship going through uh, Burlington Canal. But uh, they would take these small ferry boats from, uh, from Hamilton port out to uh, the canal. And then I have all the pictures of uh, lots of people on the, on the beach. But we don't want to skip that today. Uh, last census to take a look at. Um, it's uh, an important one. It's a 1901 census. It's the only census of all the Canadian ones that uh, had the actual birth date. So we can see here, uh, just uh, pull this up for uh, the Nortons, uh, two, uh, there were three generations of them living together. And uh, thanks to Steve, you've probably already seen uh, the picture uh, that uh, was on the uh, Facebook, I guess, where you have the Historical Society uh, notices. Uh, the picture was, and I'll show you again in a, in a second, but you can see here the actual birth dates. So three generations, all the birth dates, really bizarre, but like four of them are born in September. Um, Pretty basic information, but uh, uh, where their parents were born, uh, their religion, occupation, um, I think that was basically all I could get. I'm not sure whether that had read or write on it or not. Some of them had when they could read or write, whether they were educated, and in our case, they were. Um, but the, the age rule was not, so they were, you know, some were, some were not. There's a picture that you've probably seen already. Uh, this is uh, Clara was actually not born in 1901. She was born in 1903. But the rest were all on that census. Uh, grandfather, his parents, and uh, Hiram's parents. Elizabeth Wilkinson, but uh, Elizabeth, the one who, whose cousin uh, fought in the Civil War. This picture is uh, Northern Scotland. In the Highlands. Melissa and I were there. I had no idea how beautiful that area was. And I wouldn't have been there if it wasn't for us looking for uh, my mother's uh, side of the family, Macmillan. Couldn't find them. <coughs> Found Macmillans. There are Macmillans from that area. But they go back uh, into the 1700s and other brick wall, really. But uh, kind of neat. But uh, my grandmother, sorry, my mother was on the horse here. One of her stories, one of her best memories, was at the end of the day, her and her sister, my aunt Charlotte, so my mother and my aunt would wait on the porch and they would, until their mom would tell them to go to meet grandpa at the back of the farm. They'd run down the lane and kind of ride on the horse up to the house. With grandpa, and that was you know, one of the favorite things that my, my mom had, had that she remembered. Kind of a neat story. Here's uh, another uh, a source, another primary source, because this is uh, happening. Uh, it's in the this is a marriage certificate for uh, Frank and Lily, my grandparents. And the date will be in here when they were actually married. Uh, if I work for that, I'll find it for the moment. But uh, somewhere, oh, maybe not. Maybe this is the certificate of the actual, oh, here it is. Ninth day of December, that's correct, 1919. Well, another source that uh, is. Uh, you can find on uh, Ancestry. Uh, I don't know about 
provincial records, maybe. Um, but anyhow, another record. This, this is the, the, uh, the quick story of the McMillans in uh, Burlington in uh, 1874, bought 10 acres of land near where Mapleview Mall is, grew to 70 acres. This is their, their new truck, real truck, 1922, that they uh, were, uh, she and my grandmother would drive to pick them up, pick the pickers up. And here they are picking strawberries, the 20th of June, 1922. Um, my grandfather was uh, uh, probably uh, very organized, I guess, I'm trying to say it in a nice way. He kept track of all of this stuff. He made the records on the pictures and in his diaries. I will go to the diary for June 20th, 1922, and know that they uh, actually got their first load of strawberries for the season that day, and that they bought the truck that day. They actually bought this real truck on the 20th of June, 1922. There were uh, of the 100 crates on the truck, 87 of them were shipped north from Freeman Station. A couple of my real good friends here today, three, well actually three good friends, and all about to Freeman Station. And uh, well, we, we've actually been part of the volunteers restoring Freeman Station. So we know all about the, uh, the trains and the, the stuff that got shipped. Now this is a tragic story. This, uh, you know, if you recall the, uh, the cemetery, the two stones, the one uh, for Prudence Forbes. And I couldn't figure out who Prudence uh, Forbes was. That was her married name. Is my two time great grandfather's sister, uh, Prudence Norton. Her husband, Alex Forbes, at one time they actually lived in Cornwall. Um, this picture is from about 1865. Prudence was murdered by her husband. Right. This is. Uh, and then, you know, that's another story of uh, identifying that photo, that picture. This is an unbelievable story. You probably don't have time. You want to ask me about it later? Unbelievable story how I found somebody in Colorado that together were able to identify that picture. She couldn't identify her two times great grandmother, but I had the picture. And together, because she had the picture of her great great-grandfather, I had the picture of him here. Together, we figured it out. So now you don't have to ask me. There were both those pictures were taken in held, and on the back of the picture photographs, professional photographer, uh, Farmer Brothers, I know from doing some research, the dates, they all connect, and we were able to identify Cruz and Alex in that picture. Anyway, he, uh, this was in uh, downtown Hamilton Central uh, Public School, still there, and uh, at the back of the school where the caretaker, George Rolston in Austin was the caretaker, and Prudence was his housekeeper, and uh, her jealous, crazy lunatic husband, who had been separated six years, came back, and that's what happened. Last story. Uh, when I was a, a young guy, I sell it. Again, this was one of my favorites. I hope I'm still, I'm still okay for time here. I'm just about done. So, uh, this picture is. Of the seven DeWitt sisters. And they were from Tappy Town up on the, on the mountain, Sunny Creek. They invented a process. They were, their father was a farmer, but and then, so they had animals and geese. The sisters invented a process of uh, dyeing <coughs> goose feathers and making them into these flowers. Melissa will show that, um, she'll hang on to it. It's the actual flowers that were made in 1875. <coughs> They're in that shadow box. I 
two times great grandmother. Uh, it's right here in the center of the picture. I can only identify two of the other sisters. But what was fascinating was, first of all, about the flowers themselves, and secondly, this picture where well, they, my grandfather always said, well, one of the sisters was missing. And they, a cousin sat in. So of the seven sisters, one of them is a cousin. Well, after, you know, you figure it out, it's fairly easy to figure out because she just seems quite a bit shorter than all the others. But this was a cousin. <laughs> Found another photograph, which I didn't know if I'd have time, really, but another photograph where it's like they photoshopped the, the actual sister end of the picture. Well, if you want to pick up a card and email me, I, you know, I'll be happy to send it to you because it's so unbelievable. It's yeah, fascinating, really. Anyway, these were the DeWitt sisters. And they had a, a flower business, very successful. They actually uh, moved to uh, Chicago. My great great grandmother didn't, but five of them did, and they had a very successful business. Employed about 70 people at one time, <laughs> making feathered flowers shipped all over the U.S. and even Europe. You can see the name in there in the little ad here: Artificial Flowers to Wit Sisters. This was the address. <laughs> Last, uh, last bit that I have is an article of Del Modis, the Seven Sisters' father and mother. Her father uh, died in uh, 1905. Uh, mother had died a couple years before. But uh, this Del Modis, again from the Hamilton Spectator, is a primary source, and you can uh, go to the library. Um, maybe on uh, there are websites now called it's, uh, newspapers com and um, well, there's another one, genealogy bank. I know genealogy bank costs about eighty dollars a year. I'm not sure about newspapers com. Um, but anyway, this is a, a good example of a primary source for his death. Plus, it's, a, it's basically uh, what would be called a secondary source. For his wife's name, which then I'm able to uh, follow back, trace back from having the name Mary Corey, and uh, that's uh, another story. But uh, the Dewitts, as I, I said earlier, go back to uh, Germany. Uh, they were in the American Revolution, came into Brunswick, came to Tappy Town in 1822, and here, here we are. This, this little article talks about him coming from New Brunswick, how to piece out together. So quite a valuable little article. Uh, this is a picture of uh, where they were in uh, 1656. Uh, he was actually betrothed, uh, an eight times great grandfather, to uh, Barbara Andresian, and they lived in Albany. Which was Fort George, uh, Orange in the uh, uh, 1600s. So I, it's kind of neat for me to end today on uh, kind of this story of uh, imagining, being able to imagine you know, that my ancestors were here. And this, and this uh, you know, I may face a lot of hardships, a lot of struggles, you know, uh, and conflicts with the Indians. And uh, he was a fur trader. He was also uh, he also on the sloop, so he was you know, well enough off, well enough off. Could uh, you know, he had a business basically transporting goods from uh, New York City to Albany and back. That's uh, that sort of ends my uh, my talk for today. And uh, uh, just to kind of conclude with you know, the four stages that we're we're talking about. Is you, you you'll see that uh, first of all you're you're really confident and you should be and you should be uh, thinking I'm going to find them and then you're going to run into some problems maybe I won't but this is where 
I think if I, if I can give you a little bit of advice, is if you stop, if you have a brick wall on one, one uh, branch, go on another branch. I've been stopped a couple times and found uh, some really interesting, fun part of uh, my, my family by trying somewhere else. You'll come, uh, you'll get to the point where you can't find them, where, are, where aren't they? And uh, finally, uh, you'll hit, you'll find something and you'll be ready to go on to your next ancestor. So thanks again for having me. Looking for more great content like this? Why not check out the Oakville Historical Society's website, YouTube channel, or Facebook and Instagram pages.